I'd like to introduce you to this young man, Vian Virgin. He's a student at a school in Mombasa, and I dare say he's not like most teenagers I've met. When his school said he could do a project about any topic he wanted to explore, he decided to explore, of all topics, menstrual hygiene. <coughs> menstrual hygiene. He'd seen a documentary about the topic and was alarmed to learn that over 500 million women in the world do not have access to menstrual hygiene. And he wanted to do something about it. He wanted to make a difference. And so, he worked with local partners to design, develop, and distribute sanitary packages that were both affordable and environmentally friendly. And to this day, today, there are thousands of girls in multiple countries who use these packages. And while his story is amazing, it's not entirely unique. There are more young individuals who started their journey with a school project. Take, for example, these two. Miranda Wong and Jeannie Yao. When they were working on a biology project, they stumbled upon a bacterium that could eat plastic. And today, they've patented this bacterium, and they've designed and developed a biochemical company that helps people all around the world recycle plastics. And then, there's also this young man, <coughs> Boyan Slot. Maybe some of you have heard of him. He's a student in the Netherlands. And for his project, he wanted to design a contraption that could clean up the great patches of garbage that are floating in the ocean today. And so his, that's where his journey began, as a school project. And after having gone to college and dropping out of college and doing a TED Talk like this, and after having uh, received lots of crowdfunding, he recently realized his dream and managed to clean up the ocean in a way that no one had ever imagined possible. Now, while these stories are really amazing, and I find them quite inspiring, they make me wonder, what are we doing for the Boyans, the Zeons, and the, uh, and the Mirandas, and the, the genies of this world? How many of you are educators? Any teachers in the crowd? That's great. I'm in education as well, too. And I get to talk to schools all around the world, I talk to them about sustainability and teaching and learning. And I ask the schools this very tough question. How can we teach for a sustainable future? It's really difficult. What are we doing for global citizenship? How are we developing the skills that are needed in order to create a sustainable world in our classrooms every day in every subject? I asked this question recently to a teacher in Italy. And she said, we've got it covered. No need to worry about that, Brad. We've installed solar panels on the roof of our of our school. I said, that's great, that's cool. So what are you doing with the data that you collect from the solar panels? And she said, oh, well, we don't have time to deal with that because we're so busy with mathematics. Now, whereas you and I might see the irony of that kind of thinking, there are many more people out there than there in the world who think like this in the world of education. A recent study in the United States showed that while 80% of Americans, both Democrat and Republican, think that we should be talking about climate change in the schools. Less than half of all teachers actually talk to their students about it. And less than half of all parents talk to their children about it. And so why is this? Why, if a teacher's job is to prepare students for the future, and if the future is going to be about sustainability, why don't we talk to them about climate change? And basically, it comes down to this. It's not in our job description. Basically, it's the job of another teacher, the science teacher, the geography teacher. But we don't know how to integrate sustainability into our subject matter. We don't feel that we have the tools, the resources to do, to do this in a classroom, to make it happen. We don't feel like we know enough about the topic in order to speak confidently about it. But when I look at these results, these answers, I see something else going on. I don't think we talk about climate change in our schools with our students simply because it's not going to be on the exam. And exams are, are really an interest, interesting instrument because they tend to measure all different kinds of versions of this question. What do you know? And that's a great question. We need knowledge today more than ever, even if it's available freely online or if we live in a post-truth generation. Knowledge is the cornerstone for understanding, creative thinking, and analytical thinking. 
which is why we tend to ask, also ask questions like this. What can you do with what you know? And that's great too, because we need more critical thinkers. And we need to apply formulas. And we need to construct arguments. But why think critically if we're not going to question the status quo? Why think analytically if we're not going to speak truth to power? Or change our own behavior? What if we were to ask students this question? What can you do with what you know to make the world a more sustainable place? It's a powerful question, isn't it? It's the kind of question that would get Greta Thunberg to come to school five days a week, right? I think if we made school, schools more about impact than input, our students would be highly motivated to come to class. So what does uh, the question lend itself well to? What can you do with what you know to make the, more the world more sustainable? I think projects. Remember, uh, Boyan and Zian, Miranda and Jeannie, their journey started with a project, with a teacher in a school who gave them feedback, meaningful feedback, on their projects, on the first drafts of their crazy ideas. And exhibitions, and portfolios, and process journals, all of those things that help develop those soft skills that we know really matter in the 21st century, do we value those as much as we value the exams? We probably don't because our curriculum doesn't value them as much as they value the exams. So what kind of curriculum would support that? A world in which the soft skills are equally valuable. I sat down and I thought long and hard about that with a group of leaders in education. And we came up with a program, a curriculum, that looks like this. We call it the Global Goals Curriculum. 27 elements. I realized it looks a little bit like the periodic table of elements. And just like these are the elements of the natural world, I think these are the elements of education. You probably recognize a lot of these ideas up there, a lot of the soft skills, learning to learn, creative thinking collaboration, many of the things we know we're supposed to work on, but we never really get around to because they're tough to measure and tough to do. So, where do these things come from? What is the word curriculum? What does that mean? So we have to take a step back and ask ourselves, how do we teach for a sustainable future? How is one question. What do we teach? Who do we teach? Who do we want our students to become? And why are we doing this? And our model is loosely based on Robert Dilt's model for logical levels of change. And it incorporates these five questions. And I think the best place, and we used Robert Dilt's model for change because we knew that a curriculum for sustainability would have to question behaviors. And as Robert Dilt says, if you want to change outcomes and results, you need to change people's set of values, people's skill set, people's sense of identity. And that goes deep. So, a curriculum for change is going to be a holistic curriculum. Let's start with the why. Why do we teach? Why do we ask students to learn these things? I ask this question often to schools, and schools usually show me their mission statements. I see lots of great mission statements. Here's one I saw a few weeks ago when I was in Luxembourg. It said, we ensure that everyone in our community becomes inspired, resilient, and passionate about what? About achieving what matters most anywhere in the world. So what matters anywhere in the world, I wondered. What do the learning outcomes look like with a mission statement like that? And I think they would look like this. These are the 17 sustainability development goals set by the nations of the world in 2015 for targets in 2030. And I had to ask myself, what kind of values do we need to have in order to achieve these goals? And I reorganized them a little bit, changed them around. What if we were to value well-being, human well-being, sustainable communities, environment, the economy, or prosperity, equality, and peace? If we were to instill these values at school on a daily basis in every lesson, it would make certain the students would be in a better position to achieve those goals. But what does this have to do with teaching and learning in our classroom? What does value-driven education look like in practice? I'm an English teacher by trade, and when I was teaching English to high school students, I would often teach Romeo and Juliet, because I love Romeo and Juliet and the language of Shakespeare. And I would ask students this question, comment on the use of language in Romeo and Juliet, and I would hope they would find the juxtaposition in the balcony scene. You know the one, parting is such sweet sorrow, 
that I should say good night till it be morrow, sweet sorrow, night, morrow. It's a beautiful idea, and language arts is what got me into this profession anyways. I wanted to share my passion for the language arts with my students, not because I wanted to help them save the world. So how am I supposed to do this in my classroom? What if I were to change the question slightly to read like this? How does the author of a literary work show us why we should value people, the planet, peace, or prosperity? And certainly we see a few connections here to people and prosperity, and well-being and community, to Romeo and Juliet. If we change the question slightly like this, now we're doing value-driven education. And when we start to talk to students about their values, inevitably we're going to, talk to start talking to them about who they are and their sense of identity and their character traits and their attributes and their dispositions. Who are they, who are they supposed to become in this globalized world? Where do they fit in? It's a big question that lots of teenagers are wrestling with. <clears throat> Um, what kind of character traits are shared then by Zion and Boyan, Miranda and Jeannie? What do they have in common? And how do those traits enable them to do these things and to accomplish the global goals that we've set ourselves? Well, I thought about this with my colleagues as well. We came up with another six. Wise, social, caring, global-minded, principled, and goal-oriented. And we think if students were doing these things in the classroom more and more, and we tweaked our assignments to include these things, then they would be developing the character traits that would allow them to care for, contribute to, and excel in a sustainable world, and become the best version of themselves after all. But what does this have to do with Shakespeare? Again, let's tweak the question a little bit more. What if we were to take a scene from a literary work and set it in a different time and place, showing how the values of the author are relevant to another context. Now we've done something different. It's not that boring, stuffy, stuffy old essay on Romeo and Juliet. It's become a creative writing task, which invites students to think about all the great places in the world. Global-mindedness. What if Romeo were black and Juliet were white? What if Romeo was a Democrat and Juliet was a Republican? What if Romeo was Muslim and Juliet was Hindu? What would that look like? And when students make decisions about these characters and set the play in a different context, they're showing acts of wisdom. They're making judgments. And these are two traits, wisdom and global-mindedness, of several traits that I think we could and should be developing with our students through everyday lessons and teaching materials and tasks like this. And when we change the task to do, to do this creative thing, we are also now focus more on competencies than knowledge. What can you do with what you know? Rewrite a scene for a different audience using a different type of text while remaining true to the spirit of the author. That's going to require creativity. And creativity is more important now than ever because with these big, woolly, global issues, we're going to need problem solvers. And creative thinkers are problem solvers. We're going to need communicators because the students are going to communicate their ideas about how we should create and make a more sustainable world. They're going to need to develop their powers of expression. And that's certainly I could, something I can help them with in the English language classroom. I'm used to doing that. I can do that. Just like I can help them with media literacy when they start to research a task like this and evaluate different sources. I can help them with tasks like this. This is applied knowledge again. Subject specific competencies. We call them literacies. Language proficiency is another one that's very relevant to my subject. But I'm sure you'll see other proficiencies and literacies up there that are relevant to your subject, which we could be teaching more in schools. Physical literacy. Have you ever heard of that? Musical literacy. Computer literacy. <coughs> Civic and cultural literacy. These are all great things that I think we already know how to do with the subject knowledge that we've been used to teaching. But now we have to put it to the practice. Make it real. Make it relevant for the students so they can see the relevance of sustainability everything we're doing in every subject. And I've shown you how I focus on nine of these 27 elements in the English language classroom. And I'm sure there are many more of these elements that you could apply to your classroom. And I've taken my English high school lesson and I've turned it into a funky topic called Communication Arts for a Sustainable Future. I think I get lots of students signing up for my class with a title like that. And I think you could also do a little tweaking to your teaching 
in your class so that your subject also becomes more about what we do with what we know to make the world a more sustainable place. And you can use some of those elements to integrate sustainability into your teaching as well, too. And so I encourage you, when you go back to school on Monday morning, and you look at your students, to see them as the future leaders of this world, as the Boyans and the Zeons and the Mirandas and the Genies of this world, and the Greta Thunbergs, and look at them and, and treat them as if they are the future leaders, and they are the ones who are going to make a difference. So let's teach them for a sustainable future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.